Thanks very much, Fiona. Just get this right. Okay, thanks so much, Fiona. Um, yep, my name is Sarah Schenker. I work at Survival International, which is the global movement for tribal peoples. We work with tribal and indigenous peoples around the world, helping them defend their land and their lives. And first of all, I wanted to say how moving it is and how special it is to be here in Lancaster with you all and also everybody on Zoom. So hi to everyone on Zoom. Is that this over here? Okay, hi. And um, it's really important to be here in Lancaster remembering Bruno and Dom and the really important work that they did. Um, and also a great privilege to be able to be speaking and listening to people's thoughts as well about the questions that mattered most to them. So thank you again to Fiona, thanks to the Halton Mill, thanks to the Lancaster City Council and everybody who's been involved in organizing these events. Um, this man who you can see in the picture died a few months ago. He was found alone in his hammock and he had feathers on his chest, um, indicating an indigenous ritual that indigenous people in that part of Brazil where he lived do when somebody is dying or when somebody has died. Uh, he was found alone in his hammock with those feathers on his chest. And he was the last survivor of his people. He lived in an indigenous territory called Tanaru in Hondonia state in the Western Brazilian Amazon. And all of his relatives had been killed in massacres by outsiders wanting to steal the land. And he was the only body, the only one who survived. So the reason I wanted to start by introducing you to this man who we don't know his name. We don't know his name, we don't know the name of his people. All we know is that he fought till the very end to be able to be uncontacted and to live in the forest in the way that he chose without contact with outsiders. And that is a choice that hundreds of people are making across Brazil and in other countries as well, which we'll soon see. And they're making that choice to remain uncontacted, often because of the horrors that they've seen in the past, what can happen to them when disease or violence is brought to them by outsiders when their lands are invaded. And of course, this is a tragedy that this man has died and his people have been wiped out forever. Um, and it's a real symbol of the genocide of indigenous peoples and uncontacted tribes that is an ongoing genocide. And we really need to carry on fighting to stop that from happening again for anybody else. So there are more than 100 uncontacted tribes around the world and where their lands are protected, they can survive and thrive. And these people live in Acre, the state of Acre on the border with Peru, on the Brazilian side of the border with Peru. Um, and they look, quite healthy, don't they? And we can see that their bodies are painted with the urukum paint, the red paint that they get from the forest. And sometimes they also use the black paint, which is Jenny Papu. And you can see sort of some of their manioc um, in other photos, which you can see online of the same people. You can see the whole baskets full of manioc that they've cultivated in their gardens. And this is in an, in a part of the country which is relatively well protected compared to some others. So these people have been therefore able to survive and thrive. And this is a situation that we see repeated. There are more than a hundred uncontacted tribes around the world. Most of them are in Brazil, but some of them live in other parts of the Amazon, like in Peru, Venezuela, Bolivia, Ecuador. Um, and there are some uncontacted people in Paraguay as well and in Indonesia and in India, actually the most geographically isolated uncontacted people in the world live uh, on the Andaman Islands of India, in the Indian Ocean. Um, and they live on an island, the Sentinelese, they live on an island which nobody else shares with them. So they're the most isolated uncontacted people. And again, when you see aerial photos of them that have been taken by government planes or helicopters, flying over the land to monitor it, as had happened in this case as well. 
you can see that they look, they seem to be healthy. So it's not true that uncontacted tribes are all dying out and that there's no future for them. That's not true at all. Actually, what we see is that where their lands are protected, they can live in the way that they choose. And that's amazing. And we need to fight for that to be able to happen. So their lands often are, um, on the other hand, stolen and destroyed because of course they are the most biodiverse places on earth because these people are the best guardians of those territories and they've been looking after those territories so well. Um, the outsiders just are desperate to get their hands on those territories and the resources, the natural resources there. And today we're gonna go on a journey to see uh, some of the main questions surrounding uh, the lives and lands of uncontacted tribes and their right to survive and live in the way that they choose. And we are going to be enjoyed, uh, we're going to be joined by some uh, indigenous relatives and neighbors of uncontacted people. Because of course with uncontacted people, we, we can't speak to them, they can't speak to us, but we uh, work very closely with their relatives and their neighbors who do have contact with outsiders. And we've got several short videos that we're going to watch today to help us build a picture of uncontacted tribes. And these videos are part of the Tribal Voice Project, which is a survival project that invites indigenous people around the world to speak out about whatever they want really. So first, we are going to watch a video from Olimpio Guajajara, who is the indigenous man that Fiona mentioned that Fiona met some time ago in London. Nós se consideramos assim é um dos melhores conservadores do pulmões do mundo para todo o povo do mundo. E, e aí é, o, o meu povo sempre na conservação da, da, da mata, né? Porque é, é a era a nossa a alta sustentabilidade, né? Porque delas nós tiramos as caças para sobreviver, né? é, colhemos frutas, é, é, fazemos rosa para plantar alimentação cotidiana da, das comunidades. Né? Então, sempre veio nessa conservação. E que, e que se fazia um, um, naturalmente um, um, uma queimada controlada das comunidades. Né? Porque. Quando no, no, no chov... Enquanto não chovia e molhava bem as folhas, eles não queimavam as suas roças. Né? Então, seguido, os caras é, faziam, eles seguiam esse, essa, é, essa ideia né? muito importante, inteligente, né? que eles usavam, né? a inteligência dele, né? muito mais do que muitas pessoas que estudaram, que são estudados. Né, e que não estão fazendo nada pela defesa do, 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 do clima, do mundo. Está né? tendo um desequilíbrio no, no, no clima do nosso mundo. Né? Então, é, eu quero que as pessoas vejam é, o nosso interesse né, em defender o que resta para o mundo. Entendeu? Porque nós não estamos defendendo o o oxigênio aqui não só para nós, é para o mundo. Né? Então, as pessoas, o empresário ou entidades que apoiam a conservação ambiental, investir na, na, na gente que está realmente permanente aqui dentro da nossa terra para fazer uma boa conservação ambiental. Nós somos pessoas da paz, queremos a paz para o mundo e a paz para a floresta. É a paz para a vida dos Awá dentro da TI indígena Araliboy e, e onde existir os índios isolados no nosso país e no mundo. Dom actually met Olimpio because Dom visited Olimpio's territory, Araliboya, in the northeastern Brazilian Amazon in Maranhão State some years ago, and he did a report on the situation there for the Washington Post, which is online if anybody wants to read it. And so, of course, Olympia has just described how and why indigenous peoples are the best guardians of nature. And as he and other indigenous people always tell us, uncontacted people are the best of the best of the guardians. 
um, because they depend completely on their land for their survival. It gives them everything they need, they need their food, their shelter, their water. Um, of course, they hunt, they fish, they collect fruits and berries in the forest. And they know their land like the back of their hand. And they're, of course, also our best allies in the fight against climate change. And the solution is simple. The solution is that their lands need to be protected at the borders, uh, protected from outsiders and protected from invaders. And we'll, we'll see more about that soon. Rather than uh, market-based solutions like carbon credits, or the 30 by 30 proposal, which is a proposal that many governments and big conservation organizations are pushing, which says that by the year 2030, 30% 30 of the land and seas of the planet must be protected. It sounds great, but actually it would be the biggest land grab in history because where will they find those lands to protect? They'll be indigenous territories that they'll then go and say that this is now a protected area and therefore they'll put loads of restrictions on that area and that will be, those would be serious violations of indigenous rights and this colonial mentality of false solutions to climate change based on um, on the markets uh, are not only do they not work but also in many cases they are leading to the eviction of indigenous peoples from their territory and torture of indigenous people and in some parts of Africa and Asia for example indigenous people are, are being killed by park guards in the name of conservation and this is all being supported by big conservation organizations like WWF and like the World Conservation Society and others. So the solution, as I say, is simple, protect the lands of uncontacted tribes and all indigenous peoples from outsiders and let them get on with it. Let them live there in the way that they choose. And as a bonus, actually that's good for all humanity. Um, so, so in the Javari Valley indigenous territory in the Western Brazilian Amazon on the border with Peru, there are more uncontacted tribes than anywhere else on earth. There are more than a hundred references of uncontacted tribes just there alone. And as we know, that is tragically the area where Dom and Bruno were killed. And they were there um, as part of that fight alongside the indigenous peoples of the Javadi for the, for the well-being and the survival of the uncontacted relatives there. And I wanted to share with you a voice note. This is the last voice note I received from Bruno. Bruno and Dom and, and I and Survival and others worked very closely together as part of the global campaign for the protection of the lands of uncontacted tribes. So we were in very frequent contact. This is the last voice note I received from Bruno before he and Dom went to the Javari Valley. There's a lot of things happening there, né? O garimpo está violento novamente no entorno da terra indígena, muito próximo dos isolados do Jandiatuba. A equipe de vigilância da Univá, a Evo, ela fez bons trabalhos. Mas é isso, é perseguição, é tentativa de intimidar, não só sou eu que estou tomando essas e tem muita gente junto nessa. Mas tudo isso vai passar, eu espero. São quase quatro anos muito intensos e eu estou nessa, na resistência, mas faz parte de toda a luta, né? Vamos ver o que a gente reconstrói depois, né? Boa sorte na luta. And I also wanted to share with you this video, which is Beto Marubo, who is somebody also we work closely with Dom and Bruno, traveled with him. And he, in this video, Beto is on a boat with some Korubu indigenous people. They're on an expedition in the Javari Valley to work out where the illegal invaders are and what's going on so that they can use that information to lobby the government and to try to uh, fight with increased strength for the protection of that territory because as we know it's being heavily invaded by uh, illegal miners and fishers, fisher people um, and along with the soaring rates of invasions and deforestation violence has skyrocketed but let's first listen to Beto and then we'll come back to that. Uh, my name is Beto Marubo uh, it's Tavazinho Corubo, é, Xixu Corubo e Tichampi Corubo. Nós estávamos numa expedição agora de 30 dias para 
irmos lá fazermos uma expedição no rio Curuena sobre os índios corubos que estão andando lá no rio Curuena, numa parte é, noroeste da terra indígena do Vale do Javari. Nós estamos aqui para uma mensagem que eu gostaria de pedir a ajuda da Survival para a grande vulnerabilidade que está os índios isolados no Javari. Com o sucateamento proposital da FUNAI, a irresponsabilidade do governo brasileiro que vem acabando sistematicamente com a proteção dos índios do Vale do Javari, índios isolados. Os índios isolados do Vale do Javari estão pedindo socorro. Sem a FUNAI e sendo sucateada propositalmente de forma irresponsável, o destino desses povos, talvez daqui a um tempo a gente, a gente vai poder só contar que um dia eles existiram. É essa a nossa mensagem para o mundo sobre a nossa situação do Vale do Javari. So, Betu and the Korubu relatives here and many other indigenous land defenders are doing whatever they can do, really, day in, day out, to defend the lives of their uncontacted neighbors and relatives. And as we know, over the last four years, violence against indigenous land defenders on the front line has skyrocketed as a result of the genocidal proposals and policies and words and actions of the Bolsonaro government, which has which declared war against Brazil's indigenous people the day they took office on the 1st of January 2019. And the result of that genocide is so clear, not only in the deforestation and the destruction of these territories, but also in the killings of the people who are fighting against that. So along with Bruno and Dom, um, we've seen many indigenous friends killed over the last few years, and they include Paulo Paulino Guajajara, Janildo Guajajara, Vitor Fernandes Guarani, Márcio Moreiro Guarani, Ari Uruewawau, Original Yanomami, Arocona Yanomami, and others. And we cannot stop fighting for justice for all of them and the lands that they with all of their hearts and all of their strength fought so hard to defend. And fighting for justice, as we were saying yesterday, isn't just a matter of um, going after the person who pulled the trigger. It's a much deeper problem than that. And it goes down to the root of the system of the markets and of the governments and of the big criminal gangs that are sending people to destroy these territories and kill the people who are defending them. So this is Davi Yanomami. Some of you might recognize him. Uh, he lives in the Northern Brazilian Amazon on the border with Venezuela. And he is going to tell us about his territory and the uncontacted Yanomami who live there. Os caribeiros estão chegando lá. Eu já mataram dois, mochado até. O branco fala, índio esrolado. Está lá no mato. Está lá no tendo da floresta, o um carimpeiro matou dois. Há muitos anos ele está lá, lá no terra no Yanomami. Os carimpeiros chegam lá, eles vão acabar, porque ninguém está olhando. Ele, em desrolar, é um quartião da floresta. Nós, povos, são quartião da nossa pomal da terra, nosso pomal da do Amazônia. Todo mundo fala que é Amazônia. Todo mundo inteiro fala Amazônia. Por que que nós... Então, quero que vocês... A... Fica de olho. Fica de olho para nós, com o meu povo. So, in 1992, the Yanomami territory was demarcated. Because in Brazil, the system is that indigenous territories belong to the state. But they, they have to be mapped out, officially mapped out, for indigenous people's exclusive use. And in the case of the Yanomami, that happened in 1992 after a 20 year long campaign led by Davi Yanomami and the CCPY organization in Brazil and survival on the international level. And that was of course a massive victory. And to this day, the Yanomami territory, which 
crosses the border into Venezuela as well, is the largest forested indigenous territory in the world. And that is amazing. On the other hand, the invaders are back, supported, encouraged by President Bolsonaro. And in the last few years, we've seen so many invaders rush into the Anomami territory. The Anomami estimate that today there are about 20,000 illegal gold miners in their territory. And their population on the Brazilian side of the border, just so you can have an idea of numbers, the Yanomami population on the Brazil side of the border is just over 30,000. So that's just over 30,000 Yanomami, around 20,000 illegal gold miners. And of course, among the Yanomami, there are the uncontacted Yanomami that Davi has been speaking about. And the Yanomami territory is being destroyed largely for gold. So that's a really important and stark reminder for all of us that these are questions that are related to everybody and the demand from from the countries from from Europe from the states from all around the world the demand for gold and for wood and for, for oil and gas and other commodities is fueling the genocide of indigenous peoples and therefore we all have a responsibility to stop it um, and Ah, yes. So let's hear from Peru, from a leader of the Matzes people in Peru. Nadi Konda Shunden, Chiavi Kinsa Tantear and Kyo, Tantear and Kyo Kun Kun Serpauka Ponda. No Yashi, no Yashi, no Tetu Rabi, no Terabenski Nubi. Kumachi Chibu, Chibu, Martes, Martes, and Chios could take a kilon, the son damn the kin. Ah, to be Nar and Chusot and Tomilovi, who could come at you. No, no, Chata could take a novi, no potake. Our potan novi, our novi, our says out with the potake, shot and Tomi, art to Kumatis in them within Bogonda. Not to pocket, pocket with thinking. Not to run second, not to run second with thinking. Por Tantiame van, tan idun sun. Onke ten sun, tantiame van, ta. Atiro vidaneke. Pari, kioski kin. Ke, ke kin chuta. Aron buen. Pari. Chomenke, kia, chomenke, ta. Aren pari, kawita. Ke, ke, onke ne, ka kin chuta. Aite chimado, tis chuno. Yeah, so there's a really serious problem in Peru with. Uh, exploration for oil and gas on the land of uncontacted people and there's a flaw a terrible flaw in the legislation in Peru around uncontacted indigenous peoples which they call the Piasi law um, which allows in certain circumstances for oil and gas concessions inside indigenous people's territories including territories of uncontacted tribes and as we know that is just completely incompatible with their survival but also it is illegal under international law um, ILO the International Labour Organization Convention 169 which is the only international law that talks about indigenous people's land rights and clearly states that indigenous people's territories need to be um, owned by indigenous peoples so in Peru at the moment, we at Survival are campaigning with indigenous peoples for uh, 
indig for uncontacted tribes reserves to be mapped out fully because a lot of them have got stuck. So there's a lot of areas where uncontacted people live in Peru and the government has recognized that there are uncontacted people there, but it hasn't then done the process that it needs to do to map out those territories and to remove the oil and gas companies from those territories. And one of several examples of those areas is called Napo Tigre. And, and in Napo Tigre, um, there's a, a company called Perenco, which is a French, an Anglo-French company that is drilling for oil and gas there. And also pushing against the, the completion of the creation of this territory. So we're campaigning against Perenco and against the Peruvian government. We're pushing the Peruvian government to, to fulfill its constitutional obligations and map out this land and let the uncontacted people live there in the way they choose, which means that Perenco and any other companies in the region as well need to stop their operations there. And you can find out more about that online. And how are we doing for time? Have we got 20 minutes? We've got lots of time. 25, okay, good. In that case, let's go to Paraguay. So the only uncontacted indigenous people in South America outside the Amazon are in Paraguay. And they live in the Chaco forests and they are the Ayoreo Toto Viego Sode people. And their contacted relatives, including this man here, have been fighting for so many years for the land to be titled. Again, in Paraguay, it's a slightly different situation in terms of how the land titling works, but the basic concept is the same, that the land needs to be for the indigenous people if there are indigenous people there, including uncontacted tribes. So at the moment, the land of the Ayoreo people, the con those who do have contact with outsiders, like the people we'll see in the video, and also the uncontacted Ayoreo, their land is currently in the hand of massive cattle ranching companies who are just refusing to leave, obviously, because they're using this land, they're making loads of money. The Paraguayan government is quite happy in bed with the cattle ranching companies and isn't chucking them out. So the Ayoreo and their allies, including survival, have been campaigning for decades for the Ayoreo land to be titled for, for their exclusive use, for, for their ownership, actually, sort of in Paraguay. Yeah, for their ownership. Um, and there are several elements to that campaign. We've got a case open, the IOA have, been, have taken a case to the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights. Um, that is moving, but very, very slowly. And um, we're also putting pressure on the companies in Europe, including a few companies in Italy, for example, that are buying leather that comes from cows uh, being reared on the Ayoreo Toto Viego Sode land. So that's another way uh, as we know often when, when you try to campaign um, using pressure points that involve money and threatening the profits of big business, sometimes that is one way of campaigning that can, uh, can make a big difference. So that's another pressure point that we're using at the moment. Um, so let's hear now from two Ayoro people who do have contact with outsiders. <laughs> ちょっと、ちょっと、ちょっと、ちょっと、ちょっと、ちょっと、ちょっと、ちょっと、ちょっと、ちょっと、ちょっと、ちょっと、ちょっと、ちょっと、ちょっと、ちょっと、ちょっ
Ki mo ko ha ta wa ta mo ya ka ha ho mi te ko ha ta ha ha we ki to ta ma mi ya na na ti ga lo mo te ti ya ka ha yo ta ha ta ha o ta ya ha we ki mo pi se ha ha yo ko mi ha ta ta yo ka mo ha ka ha we do fo so mi yo ko ki ti wa ka wa we ki ya yo ko mi ha ta ta yo ka mo ka ha we na yo ko mi ga ta ka pu ti ya ka o te yo ko yo ko mi o te ha we ki ya pe se yo ko sa do be ga si ta mo ha we ya mi ya ha we Hey, wait, I'm talking about my family. Where has that happened? Okay, so now let's jump back to Brazil again and Mato Grosso State. And we're going to see a video that I filmed with, with Rita Pirip Cura. Here she is, our friend Rita Pirip Cura. Um, she is a survivor of massacres which killed almost all of her people. And she does now have contact with outsiders, of course, which is why I was able to meet her and film this video with her um, on the banks of a river on the border of the Piripkura indigenous territory. Um, but she has a brother called Baita and a nephew called Tamandua, who refuse contact with outsiders and who live uncontacted in the forest. And it's possible that there are also some other uncontacted people in the forest, but, there's, but, but the ones that we're sure of are those two men. And let's see what Rita has to say about them. Gente que, que, um, que se cura, que ó, manda o lugar, que daqui até, até tudo, né? E matou tudo, minha tia, é, é, não, é minha tia não, é, é minha tógora que matou, minha tógora que matou, é, nove tira, é, vamos embora, vamos embora, matou, vamos embora lá, o turado, para, aí vem pra cá, né? Aí tira, já tá, vai em né? Pera, aí vem que parei canoa. Aí que é, mas é, vamos embora. Aí, manda o lugar, né? Manda o lugar. É, amanhã tem de couro. Muito de pinho, é, é vento, é, é rio. Que, vai embora pra cá. Aqui, ó. Pedi pra cura pra cá. Branca com checo. Aí, ó, é cortar, né? Aqui, ó. É minha avó. Aí, para não. E para o para mim, não. Chora, não. Um branco que cortou, ele falou. Aí eu falei, eu falei, eu falei aí meu pai parou, né? Não, é um branco aqui, não é o macaco? Não, não é macaco, rapaz. É porque está em branco, tá? E que que derruba muito o dia da mantida lá. Aí eu parei a caça lá, nem tem medo. Aí minha mãe fica lá e eu... Tudo aqui, ó. Aqui, ó. Tudo aqui, ó. Andando. Andando, andando, tá aí minha irmã. Tô eu, minha irmã, meu pai, minha mãe, meu irmão. E eu, tô. Aí tu tá aqui pedindo pra curar aqui, andar. É meu irmão, é tá aí. É meu irmão, a outra aqui é, tá mandou aqui, é minha tumbiria. Tem doida, agora que eu vi da tapiri, eu tô pensando que matar, que tem muita gente que andando, tá? Que mais matar é de doida, falei. Matar aí, ó. Não tem mais. So there's Rita. I mean, it might sometimes seem all really terrible and desperate, but at the same time, Rita is such a strong woman, as you could probably see and feel in the video. And she, like so many other people who've been through so much and who really understand firsthand what is at stake in terms of the of their uncontacted relatives they they're just so strong and their resilience and their resistance is so noticeable and that that's partly what fuels me and hopefully you as well um and we can hear in Peter's voice also the urgency this indigenous territory the Piripkura indigenous territory is not even demarcated so it hasn't gone through that process that it should 
that, that it needs to go through according to the Brazilian constitution. So instead, it has this um, emergency mechanism applied to it, which is called Portaria de Restrição de Uso, which we translate as a um, land protection order, which is an emergency order that the government can put on indigenous territories, which are home to uncontacted tribes, which haven't even been mapped out properly, because obviously the people who live there are the most vulnerable of all, because not only are they vulnerable for the reasons we, we are seeing, and the disease and the violence and everything that could kill them, but also they're vulnerable because their lands haven't been mapped out. So uh, we at Survival, along with several organizations, indigenous and non-indigenous non organizations in Brazil, we've been campaigning um, for more than a year now for these land protection orders on this indigenous territory and also six other indigenous territories in the country which also haven't been demarcated. We've been campaigning for those orders to be renewed because what the Bolsonaro government wants to do is to rip up those orders altogether or not renew them when they expire because they expire every few years. And some people told us at the beginning of this particular part of our campaigning work. Some people told us that's impossible. You'll never succeed. It's a lost cause. You'll never convince the Bolsonaro government to renew these orders on these territories because the, the stakes are too high. The forces we're campaigning against are so powerful. The local politicians um, and the companies and the land grabbers who want to get their hands on these territories because they know how much money they can quickly make from them. They are so powerful. Um, but against all odds, we, we have succeeded and several of the land protection orders have been renewed, including one on a territory called Ituna Itata, which is near the Belo Monte mega dam, which was mentioned in yesterday's um, um, meetings, in yesterday's events. Um, so that one was renewed for a period of three years. This one is being renewed as well. Several others are being renewed. There are a couple which we haven't yet managed to, the, the land protection orders haven't been renewed or they haven't even been placed on the territory in the first place. So those are really urgent and we're obviously carrying on with that campaigning. And, oh, here are some of our friends in the, uh, Karu indigenous territory. Yeah, this is Aldea Awa. So the Awa people live in several territories in the Amazon. This is one of their territories, which is called Karu. And this is a, a video they filmed themselves and sent to me on WhatsApp and said, please, can you share this with as many people as possible around the world? And just to give you a little bit of context, what they are talking about is the Marco Temporal, which some of you may have heard of, the time limit trick, we call it in English, which is a terrible proposal, one of the many parts of the, of the genocidal plan of the Bolsonaro government to steal indigenous territories, is this idea that if indigenous people weren't living on their territories, or they can't prove that they were living there. On the 5th of October, 1988, which was the day the current constitution was signed, then they don't have the right to have those territories demarcated, which obviously is not true and is, goes against the constitution and is illegal, but it's the agribusiness lobby and their lawyers who've come up with some completely flawed argument based on, a, on grammar in the constitution and a sentence in the present tense, which I won't bore you with. But anyway, they, they are arguing that the constitution says that indigenous people can only have their land if they can prove they were there when that constitution was signed in 1988. So that obviously is a national threat. That's one of many national threats, along with the mining bill, along with many other things. Um, that the Bolsonaro government has been trying to do. And it would affect many indigenous peoples across the country if it were approved. It's now, got, it's now in, with the Supreme Court. If it were approved, it would be terrible for many indigenous peoples across the country, including um, some uncontacted tribes for whom there is no official government evidence of where they were on that day, surprise, surprise, because they were uncontacted or because they, were, they fled from their land or in the case of people who do have contact with outsiders, many of them weren't on their land on that day because they'd already been forced off it, but that doesn't mean they don't have the right to come back far from it. So let's see this protest video. 
from Yawa. So the Awa, obviously, they seen they had seen that indigenous people are protesting around the country, and some of them go to cities near their territories, or some of them even go to Brasilia. Every April, there's a big indigenous protest um, where indigenous people from different parts of the country, thousands of them, gather in Brasilia to protest against um, all of these threats, really. And some people from the Awa tribe had been, you know, they've been to cities, they've protested in cities. Some of them were there in Brasilia in 2019, 2020, I think. But that day they said, actually, let's stay in our forest. We like it here in our forest. We'll protest from our forest and use the power of communications, which of course has been, has revolutionized the indigenous land fight in, in the last five years or so, I'd say. The rise in access to Wi-Fi or internet in or near some indigenous communities, including in the Amazon rainforest, but not only in the Amazon, um, and also access to WhatsApp. Obviously, I'm not saying that everybody has this access, and obviously uncontacted tribes don't, but in the case of the Awa, who, who have only had contact with outsiders since the 1970s at the earliest, um, they have a few phones in, in this community, which is actually called Chirakambu, is the name of that community. And they often send us um, campaign messages and demands. And that's a really amazing, powerful tool, isn't it? Um, so where are we? Oh, yes. I was going to tell you about Vali, but I'm not sure if we have time. But Vali, as some of you may know, is, uh, is, is one of the biggest mining companies. And one of the reasons why the Awa have suffered so much and so much of their territory has been destroyed is because Vali, with the support of the World Bank and the uh, European Economic Commission, in the 1970s built uh, the built a mine, an iron ore mine, in a place called Parawa Perbas, and it's the biggest iron ore mine, open pit iron ore mine in the world. And obviously it's not just the mine because the mine comes with all the infrastructure like the roads and the railway to take the minerals to the coast to be exported. And all of this had terrible impacts on the Awa and is what led to forced contact. So the people you see in the video, those um, who were above the age of 30 or so, or even 20 in some cases, when they were born, they would have been uncontacted, but they then came into contact partly as a result of forced contact, which stemmed from this destruction of their land caused by Valley and the mining. And there's so much more to say about that, but let's jump to Kamutaya. Uh, where's Kamutaya? Okay. Yep, let's jump to from the Awa tribe to the Awa tribe. They are different people, but the reason the name sounds similar is because Awa in Tupi, because there's several linguistic groups um, in, in South America. And so the Awa and the Awa and the Guarani and some others, are, even though they're separate peoples and separate languages, but they fall into the same linguistic group, which is the Tupi and Awa mean, or Awa, means people so that's the name they've given to themselves and we are going to watch a video from Kamutaya Awa who lives in Tokanshin state and she's going to tell us the story of forced contact with her people 
Um, before 1987, the Brazilian government policy was to go and make forced contact with uncontacted people to bring them in, to integrate them, as they called it, into national society, i.e. get them out the way so you can steal their lands. Um, but since 1987, um, thanks to a lot of hard work and conversation, including in the Indigenous Affairs Department of the Brazilian government, uh, led by somebody called Sidney Pozuelo at the time, the policy changed. So the current policy is not to make forced contact, but to protect the land. And, um, and it's a policy respecting the right to self-determination, the right of people to decide how they live. Meu nome é Camu Taia, eu sou da etnia Awa, conhecida popularmente como Avacanoeiro, cara preta. Uh, o meu povo é sobrevivente de um massacre, que eles literalmente caçaram a minha família naquele pequeno território, até encontrar e tirar de lá. E como nós podemos ver nos jornais da época, todos ficaram felizes e ansiosos para ver o pequeno grupo que causava temor à população da região. Né? Então eu não quero que aconteça a mesma coisa com os isolados da Mata do Mamão. Se eles quiserem, eles têm o direito de viver isolado ou se apresentar, mas é isso a eles que decidem, não nós. O que cabe a nós é proteger, fazer com que os seus direitos sejam respeitados. Eu vejo a importância da gente lutar, mesmo que nossas vidas estejam em risco. Lutar pelo que nós acreditamos, pelo que meu avô acreditava. Porque o nosso grupo não pode morrer assim. A gente não pode deixar que o colonizador acabe com isso, porque o colonizador veio, mas esse processo nunca acabou. Está tão longe de acabar, né? So, as you can see, Kamutaya and her family are fighting for their uncontacted relatives land to be protected. And the uncontacted hour, they live in a small, too small really, patch of forest called the Mata do Mamao, which means the papaya forest, which is in the middle of the Ilha do Bananal, banana tree island. I've never translated that before, but it's the largest fluvial island in the world. It's a fluvial island, meaning between two rivers. So it's in between the Araguaia and the Javais River. And the problem, well, there are several problems, but one of which is forest fires. And you'll have all seen the terrible images and news of the forest fires in indigenous territories and the uncontacted Awa have been confronting those fires. The other thing that, the, that Kamutaya and her family are fighting for is the demarcation of another part of their territory, which is on the other side of the river, so not on the island, which is traditionally their territory, but which was taken from them. And that land is called Taego Awa. And actually just last week, I think it was very recently anyway, a judge ruled that the demarcation process must go forward. So that's great news. And it shows that success is possible, although it's not a perfect success. The judge, they, they've kind of taken some several thousand actually, of hectares off the total size of the land, which is unacceptable. And they've removed access to the river, which again is like not feasible at all. So there's still a lot of work to be done there, but it, the pressure does make a difference. All right, so as we've seen indigenous people, those who do have contact and those who don't have contact with outsiders are resisting in their forests and their communities on the front line every day, as they have been doing since the Europeans colonized 500 years ago. And also indigenous peoples are fighting back more and more on the national level and gaining more uh, representation in politics. So the last video I wanted to show you is of Celia Shakriaba. And as some of you may have seen, Celia Shakriaba here and also Sonia Guajajara um, from, the northeast of Brazil were elected as Congresswomen 
in the recent elections. And they are going to be of key importance for bringing indigenous, bringing the indigenous land emergency to the heart of political debate in Brasilia. Um, obviously, it's good news that Lula won in the recent election and that Bolsonaro has been voted out. Uh, but having said that, we're not expecting a U-turn overnight because the damage that Bolsonaro has done to the institutions there to protect these territories is so, so deep that it's going to require a lot of time and political will and financial resources as well to undo that harm, that damage. Um, also, there are other, other obstacles, big obstacles that the Lula team will need to confront, like, for example, the many anti-Indigenous agribusiness people who have also been voted into Congress and who will be very resistant to any moves to protect uncontacted tribes or indigenous people's lands more generally. And also the fact that, of course, the global market hasn't disappeared. So the global market and the demand, as we said, for these products coming from indigenous territories is still there. So that's another, another um, challenge. And the indigenous movement and our allies, their allies, including survival, will keep up the pressure and hold the Lula government to account. Let's hear from Celia. Não conseguiu nos matar na época da colonização. Também não conseguiu nos enterrar na época da ditadura. Mas atualmente nós vivemos um momento do genocídio legislado. É pela caneta que está nos matando. Quando o atual governo autoriza a flexibilização do armamento dos territórios indígenas, está autorizando executar os nossos corpos. E nós, povos indígenas, nós morremos não apenas quando executam uma liderança. Nós, povos indígenas, nós morremos coletivamente quando nos nega o território. E as pessoas têm falado na sociedade brasileira, vocês não têm medo em tempo de acentuação da violência? E nós temos dito que nós temos medo mesmo é de permanecer vivo sem poder dizer que a gente é. Nós estamos aqui por um ato de justiça. Eu sou Célia Chacriabá, do povo indígena Chacriabá. So, Celia's great. Um, this is a video that she and I filmed in April 2019, so a few months after Bolsonaro had come into office, and now from, from January she will be there in Brasilia. So, she, as you can see, she's going to be quite a strong force in Brasilia. Um, we are all responsible to fight alongside all the indigenous people that we've heard from today and everybody else. Um, to ensure that they can live in the way that they choose and to ensure that uncontacted tribes can survive and thrive. And I really believe it's one of the most urgent fights of our time. And it's a fight, obviously, the primary aim is, as, I, as I've said, to allow the people, the indigenous people to survive and thrive and live in the way that they choose. But also that's, of course, good for nature and good for all humanity. So to end, here is a QR code. If anyone wants to scan it or pick up a leaflet that we've got in the corner at the back and you can see lots of different ways in which you can take part in the campaigns in which you can pressurize governments and companies to push for the survival of uncontacted tribes. And over the last 50 years, we've seen time and again that international public opinion and pressure works and is the best possible force for lasting change. So I'm gonna leave it there. Thank you very much.